I'm going to run you through the new economic order of the New World Order. And these are now quotes from Roman Catholic sources themselves. And I would like to tell you that you haven't experienced anything yet. Waiting to come to you. According to canon law, the control of all property of the Roman Church State belongs to the Pope, its supreme emperor. Everything I say will have a quote now. Everything is substantiated by either a papal encyclical or any one of these. Thomas Aquinas said, The possession of all things in common is natural law. Thomas wrote, The possession of all things in common and use of universal freedom are said to be of the natural law, because to wit the distinction of possessions and slavery were not brought in by nature, but devised by human reason for the benefit of human life. Now what does all that mean? It simply means property is for common good. You may own it, but it is for common good. Hence, whatever certain people have in superabundance is due by natural law to the purpose of succoring the poor. Okay, now we're getting there. You may possess things, whatever you possess, but whatever you possess more than you need is there for the common good of those that don't have. Does that make sense? Now what if you create two classes of individuals, the rich and the poor? Or what if there is a situation where you have two classes, the rich and the poor? You can go across the world and you can look at the rich nations and the poor nations and you will find that the rich nations are all the Protestant nations. Have you noticed that? All the Protestant nations are the rich. Now what if you had a plan to disinherit them all? So that you would again be ruler and they would have to come and beg at your feet for anything like that. Now let's have a look at this, how this uh, unfolds for the purpose of succoring the poor. Because the goods of some are due to others by natural law, there is no sin if the poor take the goods of their neighbors. Thomas wrote, in cases of need all things are common property, so that there would seem to be no sin in taking another's properties for the need has made it common. Now this was a long time ago, surely this doesn't apply today. Well, we'll see. Not only is such taking of another's property not a sin, it is not even a crime, according to Thomas. It is lawful for a man to succor his own need by means of another's property by taking it either openly or secretly, nor is this, properly speaking, theft and robbery. It is not theft, properly speaking, to take secretly and use another's property in a case of extreme need because that which he takes for the support of his life becomes his own property by reason of that need. In a case of a like need, a man may also take secretly another's property in order to succor his neighbor in need. This gets worse. The Roman Catholic doctrine of private property is echoed in the 19th century communist slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Can you see the Roman Catholic doctrine there? Human rights are more important than property rights. It was the creed of Lyndon Johnson's great society, we shall take from the haves and give to the have-nots who need it so much. Lyndon Johnson said that. What continent is that? It appears in the literature of fascism, Nazism, liberation theology, interventionism and socialism. The universal destination of goods. This is John Paul II's expression of it in 1987 in an encyclical called On Social Concern. It is necessary to state once more the characteristic principle of Christian social doctrine. The goods of this world are originally meant for all. The right of private property is valid and necessary, but it does not nullify the value of this principle. Private property, in fact, is under a social mortgage, which means that it has an intrinsically social function based upon the justified precisely by the principle of universal destination of goods. Oops! What did John Paul II just say? He said that what Thomas said is what I say. You may have private property. The Roman Catholic Church is for private property. That sounds very nice. But it's never qualified that that property is only yours for common good. Pope Paul VI made the point quite clear in 1967 encyclical on the progress of people. Each man 
has therefore the right to find in the world what is necessary for himself. This gets interesting. The recent council, Vatican II, reminded us of this. God intended the earth and all that it contains for the use of every human being and people. Thus, as all men follow justice and unite in charity, created goods, created goods should abound for them on a reasonable basis. All other rights whatsoever, including those of property and of free commerce, are to be subordinate to this principle. And that means if I have need of a manufactured good, can I take it? If one is in extreme necessity, he has the right to procure for himself what he needs out of the riches of others. Now, who defines necessity? Therefore, because private property is immoral, all men, individuals and governments have the moral obligation to redistribute goods held unjustly by property owners. All goods includes not just goods found in nature, but manufactures goods as well. John Paul II declared that all men must have access to those goods, quote, which are intended for common use, both the goods of nature and manufactured goods. I own nothing. Only on paper do I own every, anything. The state rules supreme. My life soon could be a misery. So if you are attached to your homes here in Canada, and this is the basis for the New World Order. If you are attached to your cars and your televisions and all these things, loosen yourself. <laughs> because soon they will be redistributed and there will be nothing that the white or black or pink Protestant can do about it. And if some other suffers in the way, that is fair enough. The ends justifies the means. The redistribution will go as it should be. Rerum Novarum. Who's heard of Rerum Novarum? This is the papal encyclical that was issued that is being quoted to this day, Pope John's. And uh, to this day, all of them make reference to this, including Pope John Paul II, says this is the encyclical that forms the basis of the New World Order. Well, I thought it's important to study it. One of the Roman Church, Church State's most influential statesmen on economic matters is the encyclical Rerum Novarum on the condition of the working classes. The Rome, Roman Church State allied herself with the proletariat, which in Marxism is the great and final enemy of the capitalist order. Pius, writing, declared that Rerum Novarum, however, stood out in this, that it laid down for all mankind unerring rules for the right solution of difficult problems of human solidarity called the social question. Now, let's see. By far the most notable evidence of the social teaching and action which the Church has set forth through the centuries, undoubtedly, is the encyclical Rerum Novarum, issued 70 years ago. The norms and recommendations contained therein were so momentous that their memory will never fall into oblivion. John, Mater e Magistra. The papacy speaking, Pope Pius told us that the encyclical Rerum Numarum was instrumental in ending Leosphere capitalism in the 20th century by ushering in an era of effective interference by the government. Have you got this? Let's see how it ends up. Rerum Numarum was the voice of moral authority needed to ensure the development of effective interference by all governments in the 20th century. How many governments? All. Pius wrote, It is not surprising, therefore, that under the teaching and guidance of the Church, many learned priests and laymen earnestly devoted themselves to problems of elaborating social and economic science in according with the condition of our age. Under the guidance and light of Leo's encyclical, Rerum Novarum was thus involved a truly Christian social science, which continues to be fostered and enriched daily. Tireless labors, all these people, Labors, now note carefully, of those picked men whom we have named the auxiliaries of the church. So everybody working in the secret societies, the Opus Dei, the this, the Mites of Malta, the Knights of Columbus, all of these people working, those picked men, to bring this about. Those picked men whom we have named the auxiliaries of the church who have been instrumental this is John Robbins writing. Who are they? Under fascism, property owners may keep their property titles and deeds, but the use of their property is, as Leo wrote, common. 
fascism is a form of socialism that retains the forms and trappings of capitalism, but not its substance. This is basically what it boils down to. When we speak of reform of institutions, the state becomes chiefly to mind. Not as if universal well-being were to be expected from its activities. And what is the state going to do in all of this? The experiment with economic freedom, Pius wrote, must end. And economic life must again be subjected to planning and government. Who wants to control your economic life? Government. John Paul II wrote in his Solicitudo Re Socialis on Social Concern, it is necessary to state once more the characteristic principle of Christian social doctrine. The goods of this world are meant for all. Private property is under social mortgage. These are the things which will be controlled. He wrote, a faithful echo of the centuries-old tradition of the church regarding the universal purpose of good. In today's world, wrote the Pope, we are faced with a serious problem of unequal distribution of the means of subsistence originally meant for everybody. Then came liberation theology, and Pius wrote an encyclical on atheistic communism, an age like ours where unusual misery has resulted. Who created the misery? They created it so that they can create the solution which they want. They create communism, they create the chaos. Out of the chaos, they create the social order which they want. Pope John Paul II wrote in 1968, the church does not hesitate to defend fearlessly the just and noble cause of human rights and to support courageous reforms leading to a better distribution of goods, including earthly goods such as education, health service, housing, and so forth. Now we come to human rights. What did we read about in the French Revolution? What's going to be the standard of the world? Human rights. You have a right to property, you have a right to anything that you have need of. We are convinced that the theology of liberation is not only timely, but useful and necessary. That's what the Pope says, not me. This is his words directly. John Paul II, letter to Brazilian bishops. It should constitute a new stage of the theological reflection initiated within the apostolic uh, tradition. And then he refers to rerum novarum. Franklin Roosevelt, when he was elected, he made... Professor Ryan, part of his administration. Now, who was he? Ryan wrote in 1931, The workers have a claim upon industry for all the means of living from the time they begin to work until they die. When industry does not do it directly, then it is the business of government to enforce it upon industry. See how it starts? Right. Now, let's look at some of the human rights. You have a right to freely found unions for working people. You have a right to culture, a right to emigrate, a right to immigrate, a right to food, a right to clothing, a right to rest, a right to medical care, a right to just wage, a right to life, a right to safe environment, a right to personal security of workers, a right to family life, a right to private property, highly qualified of course, a right to common use of all goods is just thereafter, so that means nothing. A right to work, a right to pension, a right to old age, insurance, a right to association, a right to security, a right to integrity, a right to social services, a right to strike, a, a right to choose a state of life freely, a right to found a family, a right to education, employment, good reputation, respect, appropriate information, a right to the upright, blah, 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 protection of privacy, right to rightful freedom, uh, professional training, quality, right to adequate health care. Oh, it's laborious. How do you control that? How do you control it? If you're going to control every aspect of that, then you must control every aspect of a person's life. You will not be able to go to the toilet in future without making a triple application to the Vatican. <laughs> they're going to control every single aspect of your lives. That's what they're going to control. And government is going to become super huge. Now where's the money going to come from? From you. Now when the money comes from you, what then happens to your 
wealth. It gets less and less and less and less. That means the middle class will disappear. How many classes under Catholicism in the Middle Ages? Two. There was a feudal class, the goyim, and there was the upper class who controlled everything. Do you like the New World Order? Now, there's another word for the redistribution of wealth, and I've given it to you already. What is it? It's called theft. That's right. The Bible says, thou shalt not steal. That means, thou shalt not take from one who has and give it to someone else. That's called theft. That's breaking the commandments of God. Is that correct? Yes. We will see that this system of human rights breaks every single commandment of God as we go along. God gives each one a piece that is his. They take it and distribute it according to need, but you pay the bill. Fascinating. The complex circumstance of our day makes it necessary for public authority to intervene more often in social, economic, and cultural matters. The Second Vatican Council, that's what it said. So they're going to intervene at every level of your life. Lob von Gorbachev for den Papst. Gorbachev praises the Pope, and he says the Pope is right in his demand for a new world order. In 1991, the San Francisco Chronicle already said, Pope calls for a new world order. Albert Einstein says, mankind's desire for peace can be realized only by the creation of a world government. With all my heart, I believe that the world's present system of sovereign nations can only lead to barbarism, war, and inhumanity, and that only law can assure progress towards a civilized, peaceful humanity. Interesting statement, Albert Einstein. What did uh, oh, he also state? He says, there is no salvation for civilization or even the human race other than to creation of a world government. That was Albert Einstein. What did Utant, former Secretary General of the United Nations, say? He said, world federalists hold before us the vision of a unified mankind living in peace under a just world order. The heart of their program, a world under law, is realistic and attainable. What did Nortema Elder say? World peace is impossible without world government. Winston Churchill, these are big names. I'm not talking about small fry. The creation of an authoritative world order is the ultimate aim towards which we must strive. Charles de Gaulle, nations must unite in a world government or perish. How do you do that? How about creating so much conflict that everybody will be willing to give up their sovereignty? Well, the only possibilities are now world government or death. The Humanist Manifesto, too, urges us to move towards the building of a world community. Robert Miller, former Assistant Secretary General of the United Nations, said, We must move as quickly as possible to a one-world government, a one-world religion, under a one-world leader. I wonder who that is going to be. These are big, big names that I'm putting on the screen. These on speculators here and there. Pope calls for a new world order, CNN, Thursday, January 1, 2004. He made his whole New Year's speech revolve around the new world order. I want to tell you today that the new world order is intended not just to unite the nations which God had separated, that's one aspect, but to eradicate Protestantism of the face of the earth. And particularly that form of Protestantism which refuses to bow to the papal Caesar. That form of Protestantism will have to go. And we will see that under the circumstances that will be created, these conditions are all in place right now. It is all there.
We are now going to discuss this issue of a new world order. As we saw in Revelation chapter 17, the kings of the world give their power unto the beast. In the keys of this blood, Malachi Martin tells us that the greatest geopolitical giant of our age is the Pope. He says, on his trip to Poland, barely eight months after his election, he signaled the opening of the millennium end game. He became the first of three players to enter the new geopolitical arena. He says that Pope John Paul would stride on now in the arena of this end game as something more than a geopolitical giant of his age. He was and remains the serene and confident servant of the grand design. This is Masonic signal language. Here is John Paul II with the Trilateral Commission. And here is John Paul II with B'nai Berit, Jewish Freemasonry. This is a fascinating signal picture with him in the center controlling the most powerful think tanks in the world. Because that's what the signal tells us. We saw in Revelation chapter 17 already some pictures of the powers of the world giving themselves over to the papacy. Lech Waleza being honored for his work with the host in public. The Bush Gorbachev summit in Malta, George Bush referred to as a gateway to the millennium of freedom, and it was heralded as the building of a new world. It is a big idea, New World Order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause. Only the United States has both the moral standing and the means to back it up. By 1990, a peace prize went to Gorbachev for losing his country. A man of the decade he became, and the old symbols, which are Masonic symbols of the East German Empire, were removed. The communist emblem leaves. Pretoria News, August 20, 1999. Uh, summit meeting with 63, in 63 countries about neoliberalism. And Fidel Castro gives a Masonic signal. Here he is with the papacy. All these so-called countries that are against what the establishment stands for are only against in the sense that they are playing the game of Hegelianism. Thesis, antithesis, but behind the scenes, they all belong to the same club. Let's just verify that. Fidel was significantly influenced by Jesuit father Armando Lorento and Alberto de Castro. Uh, de Castro admired Fancro. Fidel was very active in a Jesuit organization similar to the Boy Scouts, the Explorers. Wherever totalitarian movement erupts, whether communist or Nazi, a Jesuit can be found in the role of advisor or leader. In Cuba, it was Castro's father, father Amando Lorente. So forget about the idea that Cuba was anti-Pope. A Jesuit was behind the scenes. They were playing the game of thesis, antithesis. When tyrants fall in Romania and Panama and all these countries, these tyrants were put in place to create a system of fear and chaos, and then they are removed and the people are happy to give up their civil liberties. We've already seen this video here of the Pope who receives honor from Bill Clinton for his uh, role in ending the communist empire. Archbishop Regali is alongside the Pope as he shakes hands with the First Lady. We honor you for helping to lead a revolution of values and spirit in Central Europe and the former Soviet Union, freeing millions to live by conscience, not coercion, and freeing all of us from the constant fear of nuclear war. Your Holiness, on behalf of all of us gathered here today, Indeed, on behalf of all the people of our beloved nation, we welcome you back to America. Pope declares the European community heaven sent. Very fascinating. Konrad Ardenauer, 
who was the German Chancellor at that particular time when this was being devised, well, he is to be declared a saint. Can you believe that? He is to be declared a saint for his work. Pope declares EU heaven sent. And saints at the moment, Roman Catholic principles, they are to be declared saints. Now, to bring about the European Union, they had Maastricht. Maastricht is a Roman Catholic little town in a Protestant country in the Netherlands. It is also fascinating that the European Union issued a poster which was posted all over Europe where they had the Tower of Babel under construction. Can you see that? This was posted all over Europe and the stars were upside down representing the goat of Mendes. This is Satanism. This is the new Tower of Babel and uh, the high French politicians said we are building a new Babel, which they emphasized with this poster, and this time we will succeed. The new parliament of the European community is built like the Tower of Babel. In fact, it has a plaque on the inside or a poster which says precisely this. And it has this scaffolding to give the appearance that it is under construction. This is rather arrogant. This is the new European identity card, and if you look at it at the back and you turn it upside down, what do you see? You see the goat of Mendes. The horns are slightly modified to give another symbolism of the seat of the earth, but uh, the inner facial features of the goat are very clearly discernible, and what these mean over here, I would rather not say. If we look at the high politicians of Europe, those that played the role in all of this, they are Masonic. That is a Masonic handshake between Schroeder and Kohl, signifying the new Mason is taking over where the old Mason is leaving. So just as we saw that uh, Kerry is a Skull and Bones member in uh, America now, and the present president is a Skull and Bows member, it doesn't member, matter which one is going to win. So here too, Mason replaces Mason. Fingering the system, they're all showing that they're all part of the same system. When the Soviet Union fell, the new emblem that it adopted was this one, the double-headed eagle. Could you guess why? Well, the double-headed eagle is the symbol of Freemasonry, and it obviously shows who is in control. The queens, the kings of the world, as we have seen, all of them are high masons and subject to the Roman pontiff. And Islam, we did a whole lecture to show the intrigue of the Islamic religion and the Catholic religion that behind the scenes, controlled by the secret societies, they have one aim, and one aim alone, subject to Rome. So what is all this war about with Islam? Who are these people who are pulling the strings in the world? And why are people being rubbed up between them? From the rock stars of the world, the bonos of the world, to the political leaders of the world, everyone seems to be bowing down to the Papal Caesar. From the East to the West, the Islamic world is currently being set up as the synthesis in the religious world, pitted against the Judeo-Christian culture as the antithesis, and then out of this must come a synthesis, where all of them will unite. This is a website, there is the, the actual website underneath, and this one, I believe, fairly accurately says who's who in the zoo. Adam Weishaupt, Astor, Pike, Carnegie, DuPont, Harriman, Bertrand Russell, Ted Kennedy. These are the Illuminatis uh, of yesteryear and today. George W. Bush, of course, he's a Skull and Bones member. That's a sub organization of chapter 322 of a German organization, the Illuminati therefore, Bundy, Habsburg, Freeman, 
Teng Hui, Hillary Clinton, Alan Greenspan, Rockefeller, Rothschild, Wahlberg, these are the bankers in the system, the negotiators, uh, Lord Carrington, Jimmy Carter, Henry Kissinger, Lord David Owen, Richard Holbrook, these are 33 free Mason, degree Freemasons, or Knights of Malta, or Bilderbergers, Committee of 300, they all belong to the same club. If we look at uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt, Cecil Rhodes, Engels, all of these, Trotsky, Stalin, Marx, Hoover, all of their affiliations, Grand Orient Lodge, for example, Grand Orient Lodge, uh, Lenin was Grand Orient Lodge, Truman, 33 degree, Willy Brandt, 33 degree, Winston Churchill, we've seen many of these before, Helmut Kohl, Committee of 300, Francois Mitterrand, 33 degree Freemason, he does... He is not alive anymore, Yitzhak Rabin, Yasser Arafat, 33 degree Freemason. These are fascinating details. Shimon Perez, Ronald Reagan, George Bush, Gerald Ford. I showed you Gerald Ford's signature where he signed for himself that he was a 33 degree Freemason. There it is, I photographed it in the lodge. And the Carters and these great political people in the world, the Schroeders, the Netanyahu's, the Gorbachev's, there is Saddam Hussein listed as a 33 degree Freemason. Now, that is somewhat strange, wouldn't you say? King Hussein, Al Gore, Tony Blair, all of these issues. Royalty, Prince Bernard of the Netherlands is 300, uh, Committee of 300, and here um, Prince, Prince Beatrice and uh, Prince Bertil, the Queen, of course, Prince Philip, all of them high Freemasons, Mengele, Walt Disney, all of these individuals. The world is really run by these individuals. Political leaders, the Bill Clintons and all of these, we've dealt with them. Uh, we don't have to go through all of them again, the Jesse Helms, the Goldwaters, the Al Gores, and all of these individuals. And I've put the, the pages up there, and there are many, many books that substantiate all of these names. So just about everybody who is important in the world, everybody who runs in the political sphere is involved in these clandestine operations. We saw in the lecture on Revelation chapter 17 and 13 how there would be a holy alliance and how the United States would eventually become the powerhouse for propagating a new world order. Gorbachev's summit in Malta, referred to as the gateway to the millennium of freedom, as you will remember, and the initiative came for this great movement into a new world order. Now, let us have a look at this video where George Bush has something to say on this issue. For institutions of freedom have lain dormant, the United Nations can offer them new life. These institutions play a crucial role in our quest for a new world order. An order in which no nation must surrender one iota of its own sovereignty. An order characterized by the rule of law rather than the resort to force. So he says, all the nations don't have to give up one iota of their sovereignty, but we want them all in a new world order. Basically, that is what he said. And if you look at the high role players in the United States, whether it's Marilyn Albright or any one of them, they use brooches which depict Luciferian connections like goats and all of these. President Clinton here is receiving the host publicly and he claims not to be a Roman Catholic. That is impossible. Hillary Clinton is wearing the Phoenix Rising, which is a Masonic symbol. Uh, Sherry Blair uses Masonic signals. The presidents, the prime ministers of the world, whether the Thatchers or the Carters or the whoever they are, all of them seem to belong to insider organizations. Whether they are religious leaders or political leaders or 
whether they are Europeans or Americans or Eastern, all of them seem to be involved.